Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, hello, Peralta. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing, Communication, and Public Relations. And welcome today to our second budget webinar. Uh, this budget webinar is focusing on the student-centered funding formula and the budget allocation model, or BAM. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel of speakers here for you today. Um, led by uh, Chancellor Carla Walter. Uh, in just a second, I'll turn it over to Dr. Walter to, to give you a little preview of what uh, we'll be discussing. Um, this meeting is set up as a webinar, so everybody is muted. Please use the Q&A button to submit your questions, uh, or you can also use the chat feature to send me your questions. Uh, we've got speakers lined up for you and we'll have time for a Q&A period after the speakers are done. Um, so with that, uh, over to you, Dr. Walter. Thank you so much, Mark, and uh, welcome everyone to our second of three webinars on uh, budget and finance uh, here at the district. And um, I'm really glad that you all are here and I wanna thank all those who worked to help make sure that this webinar is available to us. It will be, of course, recorded. So if, uh, if people uh, are so inclined and they couldn't be here today uh, while we're ha having this, they can take a look at it, uh, you know, maybe when they're having insomnia or what have you, and they need something to help them sleep. So um, if we can move to the next slide, I'd like to just do a few introductions. Um, we have uh, Mr. Siam Brembat. He's the Man Managing Director from Cambridge West Partnership, LLC. And if you want to know a little bit about them, they provide uh, comprehensive educational facilities, fiscal and technology resource planning and support to California Community College Districts. So, um, CM, which I'm going to call him, and I invite everyone to refer to all of us with our first names here today, has been serving the educational community for 35 years. Uh, we will note that he started when he was 10, but in any event, uh, 24 years of those uh, years were spent at the Coast Community College District, and he was the Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services there. <clears throat> He has an MBA in accounting and auditing and a BA in the same fields from Girardi uh, University from India. He also holds uh, special recognitions and awards. He's the recipient of the Walter Starr Robbie Award from the Association of uh, Chief Business Officials. And that was awarded to him in 2010. And the, that award is presented to professionals professionals in the California Community College um, Business Administration field who have demonstrated outstanding achievements and exemplary service as a CBO in their respective roles. So welcome. Thank you for being here, Sam. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say regarding your expertise in financial management, administrative services, cost savings, and bond programs and of course, helping us understand state mandates and compliance. And with us as well, we have our own uh, Adil Ahmed. He is our acting Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration. And you may not know this, but Adil has a master's degree in accounting from Mogadishu University in Somalia and a bachelor's degree in business administration with a, count, with a concentration in accounting from San Jose State University. Adil worked with the Somalia oil refinery as a controller and then became the director of accounting and finance uh, from 1983 to 1990. Adil has enjoyed a successful and enduring career in the educational field, including the California Community College Districts since 2003 and serving as a staff accountant business services supervisor, director of fiscal services, budget director, executive fiscal director, and of course now is our acting vice chancellor of finance and administration. So Adil, welcome. Glad you could be here as well. 
And Mark will be facilitating and I am uh, merely introducing and learning as well. So the content of today's webinar is uh, slated for about an hour. Um, there will be a discussion of the student-centered funding formula. There'll be a conversation about um, how, our, how it's impacting our district. And then there'll be some conversation about the budget allocation model and what we currently have and what we might think about moving to. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to CM. Thank you, Dr. Walter, for a kind introduction. I sincerely appreciate that. Uh, as, you, as you have heard, uh, I am connected with the community colleges uh, up and down the state uh, since I retired in 2010. And we were, uh, we are asked when the student center funding formula was in infancy stage in terms of uh, what need to be done. Uh, and we were happy to be a part of the group uh, who was discussing, doing all kinds of simulations uh, behind the curtain to see how it will work, uh, turn out. And uh, AB 1809 is the basically have provided uh, the student center funding formula uh, going forward. Uh, basically what you see this on particular slide is a, a few things that you really, really need to uh, pay attention to is the data integrity because all of a sudden it is not only the FTES, but there's a whole slew of data that is being collected and getting paid to each district. So we really need to make sure that uh, data integrity uh, that we are able to find a way to, to, to make the data integrity uh, auditable, uh, I would say. Uh, by that way, nobody raised the question because the, every time the state sends you any money, they reserve the right to audit everything. Uh, we just want everybody to know. They don't send you money and they say, you can do anything you want, they want to know. The second thing is the unduplicated headcount. Uh, you know, we just wanted to make sure uh, that we do understand that particular term because unduplicated headcounts have so many things in it and we wanted to make sure that people do compare apples to apples. Otherwise, you will not be able to, uh, you know, compare certain things with other district or within your own district because unduplicated headcount uh, can be collected in so many different ways. The third bullet is basically understanding your credit FTES, uh, because nowadays you are going to get paid for your credit FTES as a three-year average, uh, current year and the last two years, and that's how you're going to get paid. But at the same time, the population, which is ISA incarcerated, uh, large population, which is uh, for the high school student, they're getting paid 100%. So there's no shortage of dollars in terms of when it comes to the ISA and uh, high school student population. So we wanted to make sure that we continuously provide the service to that particular population. Uh, we also really need to know about the revenue at the program level had changed. You know, a lot of, a lot of programs, all of a sudden, the FTE is going to get paid 70 cents on a dollar. So you, you wanted to make sure that you look at your program and their cost as well. Uh, the last one is going, you know, go back or look forward. What do you like to look at? It is basically what your enrollment look like. Uh, and then you will be able to see what the SCFF trend will look like. So you have to go a little bit backwards in order to understand how your data is flowing in order to do it better. So going to the next slide, this is basically how the student center funding formula have started. Uh, the, the entire TCR, which is total computational revenue, is supported, were provided prior to the SCFF based on what FTES every district was generating. So 100% FTES driven revenue model for all the districts. All of a sudden, now that revenue model is being dissected for three different reasons. One has to do with our base, which was same, our FTES. But within that FTS, you do have four different components. You have credit FTS, non-credit FTS, ISA, and also 
we have the high school student population. The second part is a supplemental. Basically, state like to recognize your low income students, which is 20% of all the revenue for the district approximately will come based on who you are serving, basically. And the third component is basically student success. Everybody knows this one, 10% of the funding will come from the student success dollar. So now we have to be careful about not only the FTS, but we also wanted to know who we are serving. And we also wanted to know who is successful in our district as well, because our funding is tied to each different component. So the next slide you will see that these are the rates is being provided for 2021. You know, 18, 19 rates were different. 19, 20 rate was different. Now this is 2021 rate. The reason the 2021 rate and the 1920 rates are the same because there is no COLA provided for 2021. So I want you to know why the rates are the same because now they are locked in the statute. As long as there will be a COLA in the current year, in the future years, you will get the COLA on top of it. Otherwise, you will get the same dollars what you see for the last year and the coming year for 2021. So you can see the credit FTS is about $4,009, non-credit is 3381 But anything to do with the CDCP, anything to do with the special admit, anything to do with incarcerated program, they are getting paid 100% dollars. So they are, I would consider as a very rich FTES dollar. So if you have that population in your FTES, you are going to get paid a lot better. There are quite a few districts provide incarcerated program and also the special admit program and they walk away with the millions of dollars more because those are 100% funded, not a 70 cent on a dollar. So we just want you to know that this is how each district will look differently because it's based on what their population mix is going to be. So on the next slide, which is our supplemental allocation. This allocation has to do with who you are serving. And basically this is very important to know that whatever you serve the prior year. So when the district will submit the data for 2019-20, that count will be used to support your dollar for 2021. So it's always a year behind. I just want you to know because when it is a year behind, you wanted to make sure that all the data that you are capturing for Pell Grant or Promise Students or AB 540 is a prior year numbers. There is no three year average for this particular segment. So whatever you get, whatever the numbers are, multiply by the dollar 948 and you're going to get paid. So the, we don't have to worry about three years average. All of a sudden, for 1920, you jump 10% for your this particular population, you're going to get paid that 10% extra for that particular population because there is no more average for this particular segment. And that's why a lot of districts are paying a tremendous amount of attention to what their data is. Because if, as long as you have the data clean, you will be able to say, or you will feel comfortable as a confident that you are getting every dollar that you deserve for your district. And this is a very, very important component uh, as a supplemental allocation. The next slide is for our student success. These are all different components that we are looking at for the student success. One, the first column is for all the students and what the rate is. And then whoever is a Pell recipient, that best particular rate is. And the next one is for the promise grant. So you do have the two different, distinctively different population, Pell grant and a promise grant, and then all the students. So you can see the dollar value as you going forward, associate degree uh, for the transfer, associate degree regular, baccalaureate degree, credit certificate, transfer level math and English, each one have a different dollars. 
but you also need to know that we started out in 2018-19 as we were getting paid as a prior year numbers for this particular segment. Last year, they made the change. They would like to use three-year average. So now for 2021, you are going to get paid for your 17-18, 18-19, 19-20, divided by three, and that's how you're going to get paid. So no matter how fast you do this particular student success allocation increase, you will not be able to see the immediate dollar value coming to you because it is a three-year average. So if you are going to be working harder for 2021 to improve and 21-22 and 22-23, then you will see a significant change in a future years because this particular component does use a three-year average for all those components. I just want you to know that student success is something the legislature will really, really like to hone in to see that we have more students in our systems are successful. And that is the reason they have put this third component uh, for yours. The next slide is for a deal. Hello, everybody. Uh... Carla, I can talk? I can start? Oh, well, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is uh, uh, the SCIF in the adopted budget. I just want to let you know that if you're comparing this to the tentative budget, the SCIF in the tentative budget, the number is totally different. The reason because we're receiving updated, you know, headcount and FTS. So this is the correct and number may change, we don't know yet, and that CM will tell us about that. See, this is the current number we have today uh, that we should use as our revenue. So the SCIF, like uh, CM said, we have three parts. We have the FTS, we have the student success, and the student allocation, supplemental allocations. So 70% of the FTS is three years average. So we have our three years average, and then we multiply by the rate that uh, CM talked about. So is as uh, I'm gonna go a little bit. Uh, so if you see the total that we have, total skiff before hold harmless, if you see at the bottom line, you see we are ending up at 121 million. So what the state will do, we have a guarantee minimum revenue, meaning that you take your 17, 18, 18 minimum revenue guaranteed by the state chancellor office, and you add your COLA. By adding your COLA, we have 124 million, above 124 million. So we are hold harmless 3.8. So that's meaning that if I explain this, this will be an ongoing uh, deficit structures. So that we have to find solutions before 2023. So next, next page, next slide. So this is the three years rolling average I'm receiving from Siri Brown department. So she has her three years average and then I have the rate and we apply for the head count and that way we get our revenue for the, for the supplemental allocations and for the student success allocations. So I, as you can see, our uh, head count is, go, is declining. Declining is very, important, is very important to us because we continue declining and then our three years average will go down. Now, you know, that's what I want you to, to see on this. In some cases, we're increasing. In, some, uh, in this slide, we, uh, we practically, 17, 18, we went up. We went, we went, for, we went uh, up into uh, 18, 19. And we, we, with three years average, we have 8.4. Uh, so that's what we do to come up with our rate. And here we have the rate for each line item. So that is our uh, total revenue for the head count for the supplemental allocation and season success. Next slide. So the chancellor, this is, I'm gonna, this is the history of the budget allocation model and tax force. The chancellor under the direction of the governing board is, is responsible uh, for successful operation, reputation, and fiscal integrity for the entire Puerto Community College District. 
This is based on board policy 3250 and administrative procedures. 3250 and institutional planning, which define and clar clarify the district-wide process, the reporting recommendation and leading to decision-making. So I'm just reading this for you. That's what we uh, give you some uh, history of the budget allocation in Peralta. Next slide. So this is the partnership between the district office and the colleges. So uh, they move from a historical expenditure based funding related to a revenue based allocation model was a cult cultural shift. Uh, the, trans the transition to the PCCD budget allocation model required change in many areas, including accountability, autonomy, transparency, regular regulatory compliance and expenditures. This was to be completed with a well-established planning and budgeting integration model, BPIM, and the Planning Budget Council, BBC, is part of that model. Next slide, uh, Mark, please. So, uh, go to the other slide. This is, uh, this is the policies describing. So go to the next slide. So uh, here is the budget allocation model does not diminish the role of the chancellor, nor does it reduce the responsibility of the college, the college or district office staff to fulfill their fiduciary role of providing appropriate oversight of operations. Instead, it opens communication for further inclusion throughout the colleges and the district in the form of shared governance with respect to the decision-making process. Last slide. Uh, so this is uh, how our budget allocation model works currently. So we have the revenue less faculty salaries and benefits. We have the district wide cost uh, and the control services and the remaining to college by FTS is distributed to the colleges. So go to the next slide, please, uh, Mark. So as you can see for 2021 budget allocation model, the total computation revenue, which we call TCR, is 124 above 124 million. So what is the TCR? So I have to explain what is the TCR. So the TCR is composed of four things. You have the property taxes, the APA, educational protection account, and we have the local resident uh, enrollment. And lastly, we have the st state apportionment. Those four is our TCR. And then we're adding all the unrestricted revenue and local revenue. Uh, unrestricted, unrestricted lottery funds. Uh, AC Transit, we're getting, uh, based on AC Transit, we're getting uh, 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 roughly 90,000 as a revenue. Estimation health fees. We get the estimation application fees. We get the estimation other student fees and miscellaneous. And all these are local revenues. So you get the out of state uh, visa tuitions, those are the international students. Faculty hiring, we're getting money from uh, the state that we're paying back uh, through uh, to the part time or to the to the uh, through the salaries and the faculty compensations. And we have also what we call stairs paid on behalf of others. What is the stairs paid on behalf of others? The stairs paid on behalf of others. The state is saying at the end of the year, <coughs> here is the here is what we want you to count on your uh, on your actual actual result for let's say for fiscal year 2020. We, we, in the bottom line, we don't losing anything. So we have the expenses and we have a revenue, but we don't see the money. The money is with the state. We just see, we just do the transaction here. Revenue and expenses. Bottom line is zero. We don't, we, don't, we don't have any effect on the bottom line. So we have total revenue, $145 million. So then we have the district cost. What is the district cost? Is anything that we pay such as the OPEP, the bad debt, the irrecoverable trust that we're contributing, the 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 parent is contributing, property liability uh, uh, insurance. We have some requirement to pay the SPS contributions, or we're not going to get the grant. Is 1.2 million. So we have district utilities and we have college utilities. So once we add all that, total exclusions up front from the total revenue is 10 million. 10.2 million. So the applicable revenue to be distributed is 134 million. So now from that 134, we have to reduce or exclude the salary for instructionals and part-timers salary and benefits. So at the end, we have an available revenue of 85.6 million to be allocated to the, to the colleges. 
and the district. So next next slide. This slide is three years FTE, FTE rolling, uh, rolling average. We take the three years so we can come up with the percentage how we're gonna uh, use the revenue that is available for the colleges. So we have for uh, Berkeley City College 19.52%. We have College of Alameda 19.31%. After you adding the three years average, which is uh, 17, 18 recall, that's final number. The PT for uh, 1819, we should put that recall there. And 1920, which is uh, the number we reported on PT. So as you can see, those are the percentage. Once we get those percentage, then we allocate, we multiply by the revenue for each, each, uh, for each colleges minus what we're giving to uh, the district office. So I think that what it is, what is the last, last slide, uh, Mark? So what makes it was, uh, the model of budget allocations to maximize the funding from the SCIF. Conversation begin now. Goal is to evaluate the impact from the current BAM to the SCIF model, 2021 using the current model. Over the next fiscal year, we hope to evaluate through participatory, uh, govern, uh, participatory governance to develop a revised model and implement it for fiscal year 21-22 to escape the hold harmless. Next slide, that's where we add and if there is any questions. So um, before we go to questions, I would like to, uh, if we could go back to uh, the three-year rolling average slide. Uh, go back to back, back, back. It's the one with uh, just after, well, if you could go back to the student senate funding formula uh, budget for the district. Keep going, keep going. Uh, it's the one that has the different uh, allocations from the different uh, success formulas. Keep going backwards, please. Is a pink color. Yeah, that's the one. Go back one more, please. Return one more backwards. Yeah, oh, you have to go all the way to the beginning. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Keep going, yeah, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> that one, okay, perfect. So I wanted to add a little bit of commentary on this. Thank you so much, nope, whoop. <laughs> what happened? Uh oh, is there some some lag? It must be because I would like the the slide that has the total computational revenue first. The point that I want to make while he's trying to get that to um, display on the screen here is that what we presented in the tentative budget, it's you got to go backwards, um, Mark. I'm sorry. What we presented in the tentative budget uh, in, was a, a model that was based on cuts. That's the slide right there um, that we were expecting from the state. And then when we had the Budget Act uh, signed into, into law, we were not looking at so many cuts, but we were looking at deferrals. So that's why if you're looking at the um, actual, the area here on the slide that shows uh, the hold harmless piece, um, which has, you know, I can't really see it on my screen, but it has a significantly lower number than what was presented in the tentative budget. I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, part of it has to do with the fact that um, we are receiving uh, a different amount of uh, TCR, you know, based on uh, these figures that are being presented and what's in the adopt, uh, sorry, what's in the budget act signed by the governor. Now the next slide, the one that has a three year rolling average is I think um, as a deal pointed out and I'd like for uh, CM to maybe 
talk about. So the next slide, yes. CM, um, one of the things we note here, if you look at the supplemental allocations, I believe that you said Pell Grant recipients and AB 540 are not subject to a three-year rolling average. And I also want to um, help you help you sort of identify for us some areas where we might look at our data and see if we can make some uh, difference just by looking at our data. So is there anything in this chart that you would point out for us? Sure. Um, I think when we are looking at overall dissecting all, all your data in terms of how you're getting paid for it, uh, the biggest one kind of jump at us, besides going to the student success allocation, the supplemental allocation, which only had the three categories, uh, as you already know, Pell Grant, AB 540, and a California Promise Student. We all get paid for the prior year. So we don't have to worry about how low our score was two years ago or three years ago. So whatever your efforts are, prior last year, you're getting paid for it. Or what you can also do, whatever the better job you do this year for 2021, you're going to get paid 21, 22. So this is more prospective looking at. When I look at your number and I look at the system-wide number, uh, system-wide for, let's say for AB 540, system-wide, all unduplicated headcount represent 18% of the students are AB 540 students. But for your district is only 12%. So if you represent 18% of your unduplicated headcount, that will bring in additional students for you uh, in, in tune of a uh, few hundred students for you. And that will be a significant help because every student is $948. Yeah, so the same thing have applied for your, uh, you know, Pell Grants. You know, your Pell Grant students are also reflecting very low. Your Pell Grant students are, sorry, it's, it's other way around, my, my apology. Uh, the Pell Grant students are 18% for up and down the state. You have a 12%. So you, if you pick up about another 3,500 students, that one single category can be additional three and a half million dollars. When you, you say pick at, up, when you say pick up, what do you mean? That means every single person that you are going to report based on the, what the statewide average is, your average can be slightly higher. You are at about 12.87%, state have 18.42%. Your demographics do represent in a, such a way that you do have a lot more Pell Grant recipient students. That being said, we really need to dissect further to see how we are collecting the data, how we are recording the data, how we are submitting the data, what are the error report comes back to us. So if you are able to find a way to do more better job of data integrity, then you will be able to find a way to say, okay, we may have not counted some students. Maybe some of the processes are not being followed equally good at all four colleges. Maybe if, once we dissect this data further by each college, then we will know immediately how each college is performing for this particular segment, whether it is for the Pell Grant recipient, maybe one college is not getting as many as what they're supposed to get, then you can go further. Then you can go, far, go down. So if for the Pell or even say Promise students, statewide, 36% of the students unduplicated headcount is a Promise students. In your district is 27%. Mm. So if your average would have been similar to the state, like a 36%, you can have additional almost 3,000 3, additional students, which is $948 for each student. So I'm not saying it is a straight math, the way I'm explaining it to you, 
but there may be a room for you to improve those particular population when you submit. Your, your, your population is not reflecting what the state population is. Okay. Well, okay, I appreciate that. And if, if uh, so to take the point all the way, and then now if Mark, if you can go, um, if you can go just to the, the budget allocation model slide towards the end of the presentation, because what I'm interpreting here is that if we take a look at our data a little closer and ensure that it's um, crystal clean, if not to say that it isn't, that we could in fact uh, work our way out of quote, the hold harmless just with, with making sure that our data is correct. So one of the things that we wanted to do is work with our budget allocation model. Um, you can keep going um, to revise it. And um, so just before we get to the QA, um, I would like to hear from you know, CM again, just a little bit about thoughts on a budget allocation model that would reflect some of the attributes of the student-centered funding formula and what your what your just a thumbnail sketch of how we might think about that for our district well as you already know that moving away from the sb 361 to the skiff is a little bit different before it was all the revenue model and how the district can distribute the dollar to the colleges uh, it was totally up to the district how they distribute to the colleges. But now, in order for us to inspire the colleges to do better in terms of the student success, and also for the supplemental part of it, and also for the FTS generation, we really, really need to look very carefully in terms of how the colleges are producing each component of the scheme. In order to do that, and use that as a revenue allocation model to the colleges, it will directly correlate to the colleges for more additional revenue for them into the future years. Because right now, the way under the old budget allocation model, they are all locked in right now. Locked in in the sense that you have district-wide services comes off the top, centralized services comes off the top, full-time faculty, part-time faculty comes off the top, that does not provide the enough revenue for the colleges for their operational purposes. But if you allow them to look at what revenue they generate and what expenses that they have it on their colleges based on the skip allocation model, they might be more careful about how they would like to spend their money down the road. That doesn't mean that you will not be provided with the district office expenses and a centralized services expenses. We are currently working with the six multi-college districts to move from the SB 361 to the student center funding formula model moving forward. But that is considered as a more transparent, uh, bring the stakeholder to the table, open the conversation, and move for this point forward if that is the desire of the district. For 2021, you will use your old model because it is not possible to kind of do it immediately. But along the way, as you're going to be submitting your P1 report and P2 report, you will be able to start comparing the data side by side and start seeing it, what the old model looks like and what the new model looks like and what are the differences between the two models and what are the expenses that you like to bring it to the table so people can talk about it. And, it, and majority of the time, the most conversation uh, is always about what is in a centralized services and what is included in a district office. Basically, those are the conversation. Once everybody agreed about it, then, then it is a lot easier for the colleges to kind of say, okay, we can live within our means because this is what our revenue is. Once you establish the starting point for the colleges, then they can do everything innovative on their own campus to see how they can improve either their student success 
scores, how they can improve their supplemental score, how they can improve their FTEs. Because right now, the incentive is not there under the old model because you provide them the target, but if they don't meet the target, there's nothing that they, they really lose out. Is the district has to struggle with all the time. So SKIP model does provide some incentives, but at the same time, held them accountable for it as well. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, that synopsis. And um, we have, I'm gonna, uh, Mark has indicated that um, if he's going to do Q&A, he may need to stop sharing the screen. So, uh, Mark, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Ah, uh, thank you, Dr. Walter. Uh, and now that I've stopped sharing the screen, I can see the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. Well, one of the questions that came in through chat um, um, was, about um, the incarcerated population around the Peralta district. And the question was, what, what can we do to better track the data uh, around that particular population? Because it seems like that, that would be something that would benefit us. Looking at the data, the only thing I can share with you is that you have not reported any incarcerated student population 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20. Currently, you don't have that population. The incarcerated population is basically the people who are in, in, uh, in, in a jail, and then you providing that education directly to them via different methods. These are not the people who are out of the jail and could be living in your community and considered as incarcerated students. So, so some people may not have the clear definition about what is the incarcerated student population is. They, if once they are out of it, they become your regular student. And majority of the incarcerated people who are out of the jail, they can be your student. Few of them will even be eligible for promised students. They may be eligible for the Pell Grant and you will be able to bring them into the mainstream. So that's how you will be able to capitalize helping them to get on their feet once they're out of the jail. But while they're in the jail, you can also offer them the program and you can count their FTEs and they can also participate as a Pell students uh, or into the program as well. Thanks. Great, thank you, CM. Okay, we have a question about uh, fees that we collect from students. Uh, this question is about, uh, in particular, the AC transit fees. And um, the question is, I heard student government voted to eliminate the AC transit easy pass starting fall 2020. Uh, if this is correct, then we will not receive AC transit revenue. Uh, please confirm. Um, so I can answer the first part, which is the student vote, and that is correct that the associated student governments across the four campuses voted in the spring and uh, across uh, the four campuses in aggregate, the decision was, um, the, the vote did not pass to continue the AC Transit um, uh, Easy Pass service. Adil, um, maybe I can turn it over to you for what that impact is on, on our budget. So I just want to first clarify one thing. We're not getting any revenues. We're collecting revenues for uh, AC Transit. There was a contract. I think this contract is ending this fall, I believe. Uh, so what her name, uh, City can respond to that. We have, a, uh, we have a contract, I believe, in this fall. We're not getting any revenues. The revenues we're collecting from the student go to our balance sheet, and then we pay it back to AC Transit. This 90000 is a difference between the contract and what we're collecting that is only 90,000 and it's not that huge, but we're not collecting any revenue. That, that's not what I can say about that. But after that, we're not gonna get anything because uh, there is no contract anymore. And I brought this to a series saying, why are we paying uh, AC Transit when our students are online, right? But there is contract. So we have to fulfill that, those, those, those contracts. Thank you. Again. The next question is uh, about the rolling averages. Uh, the rolling averages are based on enrollment 
And I think this is for the, the first segment. Yes, so it's based on FTS, that's, that's enrollment, so that's correct. I'm not trying to correct a deal, but that is enrollment, but whatever the FTES is that you're getting paid for. Absolutely. You, your enrollment could be a lot higher, but is that not yielding into the FTES? Yes. They use the FTES as an average for the credit FTES, not so th enrollment. Thank you, CM, uh, that, uh, to clarify that, because when we say enrollment is only a uh, residential, residential FTS that the state will pay us, other, the other one will be a uh, local, local resident that we're collecting, is only what we're reporting in our uh, data is the, uh, the resident. Yeah. We're not getting out of state or international student from the state. So for example, if you have a 300 students and taking only one class, you get, you're going to get 100 FTS. You have a hundred student enrollment, but taking three class, you're still getting the same FTS and mm -hmm. get, uh, getting the same FTS, you know. So the, we are not counting the enrollment, we are counting the FTS. FTS, for yes. The so I believe one FTS is 15 units, right, CM? I'm sorry? One FTS is 15 units now. It used to be 12 that's units. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, that's what the way we calculate this uh, FTS. Any other question? Yes. So um, given our current situation with a global pandemic and some of the restrictions on travel, uh, the question is how do we uh, project the F1 visa uh, international student fees into our uh, academic year for 2020 and 2021? I believe we still have a student that's still here and our, uh, our uh, revenue on an international student will decline, but we still have a student that I think believing taking online classes. So we don't count in uh, other coming back from any country, but the one that already inside. Even though, even though our enrollment, I'm getting this enrollment from the, from Siri Brown uh, department. So they are the one counting how many international students we have. Finance has no mean to calculate that unless we get the data from uh, our uh, 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 research department or educational department, international department. So what I know, our enrollment was uh, declined on, on international student. Yes. Perhaps a good point to, to clarify that um, initially there were restrictions on international students that would prevent them from taking online courses um, but after nationwide outcry against that, the federal government reversed that policy. So our international students that, as, as Adil pointed out, that are here now that are uh, taking online classes, they are allowed to continue to take those classes, which is very, very good news and, and nice to see a, a rational uh, decision from our federal government on that front. Uh, we have another question uh, on fiscal year 2020-21, the budget allocation model slide in the total revenue section, there are faculty hiring and faculty compensation on the list. Can you explain how these two items uh, are considered as revenue instead of expenses? Okay, so we, 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 we include this, the, the expense side, we, the district is paying those uh, faculty compensation and faculty hiring through the salary, but we're getting reimbursed by the, by the state. So what we're getting from the state will go to revenue side, whatever PCD is paying will go to the expense, the net is zero. So that's the way we do that. I would just like to add that um, a lot of the spreadsheet information that you see is, is set up because by accounting minds, you know, we have inquiring minds, people who want to know, and then we have accounting minds who <laughs> they have the, the need for an income and an expense and it has to be some, a balancing there. Absolutely. And that's exactly the question with the AC transit uh, issue. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what is shown there is this need to, you know, uh, balance uh, yes. income and outgo. 
And then I would also like to just say one other thing about the international students. And I am very grateful that, um, I think it was, wasn't it San Francisco that, or the state of California that sued to uh, allow students to continue to uh, pursue their education? It, so I think, I just wanna amplify how great that is for us and our students. So, but anyway, that's, I just wanted to clarify this last question. Great, thank you. With the revenue deficit percentage of 8.16% based on P2 for 2019-2020, uh, what is the district plan? So let me start that answer and then um, uh, I'll turn it over to CM and Adil. I think one of the, one of the um, things that we need to keep in mind is in, a, in, in our next webinar, we'll be talking about advanced apportionment, P1, P2, and so forth. But one thing you must keep in mind is that when you're looking at the TCR and you're looking at the deficit factors, they change depending on where we are in that advanced apportionment P1, P2 cycle. So if you were looking at it at the tentative budget stage, it was a certain number and now it's a certain number and it gets smoothed out depending on how the overall state budget is working and impacting all of the California community college districts. So with that, maybe CM, you can give us a little bit more on that. Sure. Yes, because this was a this was a question asked by almost every board and everybody up and down the state. When they certified the P2 report, the state budget was not approved at that time, and they do need to certify the P2 report. So they did certify with what they know at that time, and they put 8.168 percent deficit factor at that time. Since then, the 2021 budget is already passed, and that budget impact called a deferral. For 1920, they deferred the dollars, and 2021, they deferred the dollars. So the deficit reduced from 8.168% to less than 1% now for 1920. I just want you to know that the that entire deficit is already gone because of the using the deferral dollars, but you still have about little less than a 1% deficit still hanging over. The same thing is for 2021, because they are using the deferral for the 2021 budget year. So there is a also less than a 1% deficit also for 2021 right now uh, on an ongoing basis. But as, as Dr. Walter has said, this number will change as the budget situation will change. State is going to come back in the month of October to see exactly what their revenues were for 2019-20. And just around the corner in January, they have to unveil 21-22 budget. So we will be seeing some of the changes throughout the year. This may be the most difficult year for any district or any public agency to gauge exactly where the revenue numbers will come. So right now for 2021, everybody's using little less than 1% deficit going forward, one year at a time. There is nothing I can add. CM said everything, we have a less than 1% deficit factor. So I think uh, we're handling very well for 1920. I'm not gonna speculate our numbers, but I think Peralta will be in a good shape by, uh, for 1920. And 2021. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a comfort to hear. <laughs> That's great. Uh, at this point, uh, there are no more questions. We only have three minutes left. So I think this is a good time to uh, draw a line and say thanks everybody for dialing in today. Uh, in, in just a second, I'll turn it over to you, Doc, uh, Dr. Walter, for his, uh, closing comments. Um, well, actually, why don't, why don't I turn it over to you and then you can turn it back over to me and I'll remind some people of what our upcoming dates are. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, CM and Adil, both of you, for um, your uh, insights and for giving us some ideas about where 
we can uh, focus our efforts, especially when we're thinking about the budget allocation model and thinking about maximizing our revenues from the student-centered funding formula. And of course, Richard, I know you're there and I just wanna say thank you for all that you've done and uh, other folks that are not immediately visible who helped make this webinar uh, a possibility for you. So once again, thank you again. And so back to you, Mark. Great, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, our next budget webinar is coming up on September 1st uh, from one o'clock to two o'clock in the afternoon, and that will be on the 50% law uh, in advance in periodic apportionments. So please join us for that next budget webinar. Uh, and then in addition to that, I wanted to put in a plug for uh, the Chancellor's Town Hall listening sessions. Uh, we have another session coming up on Friday, uh, August 28th from one to 2 p.m. Uh, another one on Tuesday, September 1st from 9 to 10 a.m. And then another one on Wednesday, September 2nd from noon to 1 p.m. These are really open um, town hall sessions. Uh, they are intended for all, uh, everybody in the Peralta community to join us, meet Chancellor Walter and let her know what's on your mind, uh, what concerns that you have and, and um, any positive comments that you have to share. Uh, about working at Peralta. And with that, I will say thank you all very much for joining us again and have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.